Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar titled Using SARS-CoV-2 to Teach Physiology and Science. I'm Sarah McFarlane, and I'm pleased to be your host for today's event. Joining us today, we're very fortunate to have Dee Silverthorne, a distinguished professor of physiology from the University of Texas at Austin. She will discuss the ways she's used the coronavirus to teach her students about physiology, science, and how to interpret interpret sources of scientific information. This is the third of four events in the Teaching Anatomy and Physiology series, which has been made possible by the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society and 80 Instruments. So a big thank you to them for their support. For over 30 years, 80 Instruments has been creating simple, flexible tools to help scientists and educators record and analyze data quickly and efficiently. 80 Instruments solutions bring active learning to your lab, classroom, or online course with easy to use software platforms, interactive content, and hardware, including the newly released LT sensors. 80 Instruments customizable education systems provide all the experiments, hardware, software, and lessons needed to teach and create a stimulating learning environment that guides students to connect theory and practice. If you're interested in exploring these solutions further, please see the resources panel for links to their website. Now, before we get started, I would like to share just a few housekeeping notes to help you get the most out of the webinar today. First, this webinar is being recorded and resources will be made available following the event. Next, if the webinar panels look too big or too small, you can zoom in or out on your internet browser to adjust the viewing area. Please send questions, thoughts, and comments to us using the Ask a Question panel next to the media window at any time. You can also take a look at the resources panel where you'll find a few links associated with today's event. We'll also be running a number of audience polls during the webinar today and a survey at the end. So please chime in and share your perspectives with us. And finally, if you do happen to experience any technical issues during the event, the easy fix tends to be a simple refresh of the browser to reestablish your connection. However, if this doesn't work for you and you continue to have issues, just use the Ask a Question box to communicate your issue with our team and we'll help to get you back up and running. So before we get started with D, I did want to run a couple audience polls. Um, so please take some time and, and answer these questions for us. We'd really appreciate it. So the first question is, have you included and or encountered a lesson about COVID-19 in your physiology classes? Um, so there's three options. Yes, no, but you plan to teach it, and no, and you probably won't include it um, for your future lectures. Great. So um, this is a question that Dee was particularly interested in learning um, a little bit more about her audience today. And so I'm actually going to share that polling result slide with you all. Um, thanks so much for participating. And um, Dee, there's your answers. So um, you could take a look at kind of the spread that we have here and, and how people are adapting their courses, uh, it looks like, to plan to teach a little bit more about COVID-19 in the future. So that's really exciting. Um, and thank you everyone for participating in that poll. And we do have one more question here. This question is, do you normally teach about the immune system in your physiology or A&P classes? Um, so there's a couple options there. Yes, I do a little bit, but only as it pertains to other systems. I don't, but I plan to in the future. And no, and I have no plans to. So please uh, participate in that and thank you again in advance um, for taking the time to answer these polls. We really appreciate it. Okay, and so this is the polling results for that. So it looks like a lot of people do teach about the immune system, which is really awesome. Um, and it looks like a, a couple of people will uh, plan to in the future as things uh, move on. So thank you again for participating. And um, with that, I would like to officially welcome our wonderful speaker for today. Um, so Dee, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Over the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking about how I have taken the recent uh, year and the pandemic events to try and keep my students interested in the, the basic physiology that we teach. 
to start with, I want to point out that I am not an immunologist, I'm not a virologist, and I'm not a physician. So this really is going to be the basic scientist interpretation of information that's publicly available. And it's only going to be peripherally about the uh, medicine and healthcare aspects. If you look in the resource window at the right, I've posted two handouts that have a lot of free resources that I have used in compiling this talk and also my teaching, as well as a handout showing where you can get some of the images that I'm gonna be using in today's talk. So today we're gonna to be focusing primarily on the physiology, but a little bit of pathophysiology and a little bit of pharmacology. But depending upon what you teach and your comfort level, there are a lot of other areas you can explore. Uh, genetics, and there's a lot coming up with that with all the new variants that are coming out. The immune system, and particularly the molecular biology, the immune response and inflammation. And then also techniques, molecular biology techniques that are used for detection of the virus. And then depending upon who your audience is for your, in your students, you can get into vaccine development epidemiology, ethics, and the design of the biomedical research. I'm gonna be talking today about using COVID, and I will use the word COVID to mean both the virus and the disease, um, and how it fits into physiology. And I think one of the things that I found most interesting is that it can be used to help students see the core concepts in physiology that we try and focus things on. And so they can begin to see some of these repeating patterns as they apply to COVID. It's also a good chance to show them some examples of normal physiology gone wrong and simply examples of where uh, the virus is using normal physiological processes. As we do this, it's uh, going to be obvious that they get to see some of the process and how scientists think, as well as some of the uncertainty in science. So today I'm gonna to talk about some of the AMP related content that we can teach, as well as how we can use active learning, a particular favorite of mine, to teach this content. With the core concepts, I like to start at the beginning of the semester when we're doing cell phys and membrane processes, membrane transport and such. And so for my students, I developed a little icon that gives them an idea that this is something that they need to understand this basic process in order to understand the coronavirus and COVID-19. And here's an example of one from a slide. Uh, we were talking about RNA and translation, and it says, hey, to understand how the RNA viruses and vaccines work, you need to understand this process. So trying to give them a heads up at the beginning. Then as we begin our traditional march through the organ systems, I signpost areas that are gonna be related with this little icon that I actually found on the internet. And I think it's really important when we're teaching core concepts that we need to be explicit with our students. It took me some years to figure this out because I saw the core concept there as it popped up in different systems, but I didn't realize that that's something experts do and that with our novice students, they really need to be uh, alerted each time until they can start to see the patterns. So in addition to homeostasis, which is obviously our integrating concept for physiology, I think one of the most valuable things about including COVID in a course is to give students a better sense of how multiple body systems integrate. So even though this is a respiratory uh, virus, primarily it starts and then pretty soon it's in the circulatory system, it's all over the body, and you've got the immune system working against it. So multiple body systems get involved. The other thing that I think is important for students to see in relationship to this pandemic is the tremendous variability in human populations. 
you can say, well, the COVID-19 often presents with X, Y, and Z symptoms, but not everybody's going to exhibit those symptoms. I think in physiology too often we say, you know, average blood pressure is 120 over 80 and students assume that that is a hard and fast number. So getting them alerted to variability, I think is, is critical. The other big theme that I like to use COVID for is to talk about proteins and particularly the principles of protein binding, such as binding sites and specificity and the fact that a single protein can have multiple functions. It can be a receptor, but it can also be an, uh, sorry, it can be an enzyme and also be a receptor. And then membrane processes, transport, endocytosis, exocytosis, and then of course the role of RNA in the cell with translation. And then finally, signaling and communication, both signaling within the cell itself, the host cell when it's invaded, as well as the immune signaling and the production and distribution of cytokines throughout the body that play such a huge role in the pathophysiology. So for the content today, um, I was actually surprised to see how many of you teach immunology because in uh, many traditional physiology courses uh, that are taught as standalone physiology, there's often a separate immunology class. So for my students, we don't do immunology in the physiology class. And so I start off the semester telling my students a little bit about coronaviruses and viruses in general, just to make sure we're all on the same page. And then we're going to look, and this is the focus of where I use it in my teaching, at the process of infection and the role of angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2. Then we'll look a little bit at defense mechanisms and a little bit at the pathophysiology. As we go, you'll notice that there's going to be text in blue along with a question mark. And these are questions that I might be asking my students as we're going through. So as I do this talk with you, I'm gonna try and model the active learning strategies that I would use with my students. They fall into three general categories. The first one that I like to call ask, don't tell is simply thinking of where you can turn something that you might say to them, like, remember when we studied X, Y, Z, and then you tell them, you ask them, you say, what do you remember about when we studied X, Y, Z? And this is actually a teaching technique called retrieval practice. And it's been shown that it helps students cement the earlier material and incorporate it into later material so that they retain it better. We'll also show a little bit of discovery learning where you walk students through steps until they discover the conclusion for themselves. And one of my favorite things is to ask students to predict. And the key point uh, with this is you say, given what you know about something, predict what might happen if. And the thing to remember if you're doing this with your students is the prediction doesn't need to be correct. It doesn't need to be what actually happens. It just has to be rational based on what they know at the time. And in many ways, asking students to do predictions is asking them to think like scientists, because that's really how we develop hypotheses that we want to go test. So you'll see a number of places where I'm asking my students to predict something. So I start off with a little bit about viruses with my students because I think probably the biggest misconception they have is that viruses are alive. And this is of course perpetuated by the media that talks about killing COVID. Um, but these viruses are not alive in the same sense that other organisms are. They're intracellular parasites that require a host cell. And if they cannot get into the host cell to reproduce, then they will over time break down and uh, disappear. So the viruses have a central core of either DNA or RNA. They have around them a capsid that is made up of proteins. 
And then some of the viruses actually have an envelope outside of that. So here's a picture of a coronavirus, which is the, the family of viruses that SARS-CoV-2 belongs to, as well as the common cold. And you'll hear people say, oh, it's called a coronavirus because the gold spike proteins look like a crown. But it actually, the name comes from the electron micrograph pictures of early coronaviruses, where the scientists studying them thought that the halo around the virus particle resembled a solar corona as seen during an eclipse of the sun. In this picture, you can see uh, the coronaviruses are single-stranded mRNA viruses and that's the gold spiral inside the cell. And then the red dots around them are the uh, viral proteins that form the capsid. It's an enveloped virus, and the envelope is actually a phospholipid bilayer, similar to our cell membrane, because it is actually derived from the rough endoplasmic reticulum of the host cell. And then as the virus is reproducing, it creates its own proteins and glycoproteins. And the one that we will be most interested in is the one, the gold that you see in the picture, the spike glycoprotein. And these are important because they are the uh, attachment proteins. They are how the virus is going to attach to the host cell and get inside. And I'm not gonna talk today about the other proteins. So this, um, I looked for a lot, of at a lot of figures and many of them talking about how the coronavirus and SARS-CoV get into the host cell were simply too complicated for my students. So I created this little PowerPoint animation for them. So we have a virus particle at the upper left and it goes down and it binds to a receptor protein on the outer surface of the host cell. The binding and some subsequent steps then cause endocytosis of the virus particle and the receptor. And at some point in this process, the viral envelope, the phospholipid bilayer of the envelope, fuses with the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane. And when that occurs, then the viral RNA can escape into the cytoplasm. And at that point, the viral RNA takes over the cell's synthetic machinery. It starts making new viral RNA, and then it uses the RNA message to create viral proteins, which then go into the rough endoplasmic reticulum and assemble and become enveloped in the uh, phospholipid bilayer of the rough ER to make new particles that can be released by exocytosis. And so now we have newly made virus particles out into the blood and interstitial fluid where they can go off and find a new host cell. So this was my simple, simple version of uh, the process. So the question I ask students then is, why would a human cell have a receptor for a virus that can kill them? We've been talking about receptors in our cell phys, where there are receptors for signal molecules or receptors for endo, uh, receptor mediated endocytosis, but why would we have a receptor for something that can kill us? And the answer is, it's not really a receptor. What we are seeing as function as a receptor for SARS-CoV-2 is actually an enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme 2 that has normal physiological functions. And what happens is the viral, the virus actually then is hijacking the enzyme and functioning, causing it to function in a different way. So this is a figure, this is a similar figure, much nicer than the one I, I did, but it comes out of a new journal published by the American Physiological Society that is called Function. And it happens to be an article about COVID and the uh, epithelial sodium channel, ENAC. And I use this figure to give to my students and start asking them questions. So the process shown here is a little more complex 
where the spike glycoprotein in the virus binds to the surface enzyme ACE2, which is in red. The next step, and I usually don't go into a huge amount of detail with this for my students, is that there is a transmembrane serine protease that is responsible for cleaving part of the spike protein, and that then activates the endocytosis of the uh, virus particle. And the endosome comes in and brings it into the cell now. And you can see the same steps for replication and release. So at this point, the question I ask my students is, what is this ACE2? We've studied ACE. How is it different from ACE? And it's a good chance for them to remember what they know about ACE. Well, it turns out ACE2 is a transmembrane protein that is actually an extracellular enzyme. The catalytic portion of the membrane of the protein is on the outer surface of the cell. And there's a name for these. They are called ectoenzymes. And so now my question to my students is, you've seen some ectoenzymes in other body systems. Can you remember where we saw them? And I think probably the most common place is we talk about them as the brush border of the small intestine. So this is a picture of an enterocyte. Um, I chose to draw the brush border ectoenzymes that are used for peptide digestion, but there are also some for carbohydrate digestion. And essentially you've got small peptides coming into the intestine. The surface enzymes, the brush border peptidases then are breaking them down into di and tripeptides that can be absorbed. And some of those are further broken down into single amino acids that can be absorbed. So I think this is probably the most common place we teach ectoenzymes consciously, but it turns out many of the same uh, peptidases are found in the proximal tubule brush border. And this is how then filtered peptides get reabsorbed through the proximal tubule and don't end up in the urine. But if students are really smart, they can think of one more example where we usually teach about an ectoenzyme. And that's the neuromuscular junction, where we have the axon terminal releasing acetylcholine onto a skeletal muscle fiber. And in that process, there is an ectoenzyme which is acetylcholinesterase that is used to break down acetylcholine so that it can uh, terminate the activity. So here's a very nice example of a repeating pattern of ectoenzymes found across multiple systems of the body. Next, let's look and see what ACE2 is and how it relates to ACE. So I think this is something, a pathway that we normally teach in physiology, where the liver is constantly producing an inactive protein called angiotensinogen. And the, in response to low blood pressure, the kidney releases the enzyme renin, and renin converts angiotensin to angiotensin 1. There's a second step required for this process, which is angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE. And ACE converts angiotensin one to the active peptide angiotensin two. And it is angiotensin two that has multiple targets, all of, uh, and multiple responses, all of which are ultimately aimed at raising blood pressure, the opposite of the trigger that released renin. So vasoconstriction is important, uh, action at the cardiovascular control center, and then also aldosterone release. So this is where we normally teach ACE. So the question to students is, when we first discovered ACE, the scientists thought it was found only in blood vessels of the lungs. Why would lung blood vessels be the ideal place to put an enzyme like this? And the answer is 100% of the blood is going to be passing through the lungs with every circuit because you've got 
all the blood coming out from different body tissues, but then it goes out from the right side of the heart into the pulmonary circulation. So it's the one place you could put this enzyme on the surface of the endothelium to be sure that it is going to be exposed to all of the angiotensin one that is in the blood. So this is an anatomical reason for the, the function. Let's go ahead and look now then at the family of peptides that we call the angiotensin family. So here are the three that we just talked about. The inactive angiotensinogen, which is actually quite large, 452 amino acids, and it is converted by renin to angiotensin 1 with only 10 amino acids. So this is the N-terminal end of the big protein. And then to get from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which is where ACE comes in, all we do is take off two amino acids. So here are small peptides that have a lot of activity. What I think most of us don't teach in a normal physiology course is what happens to angiotensin 2? What are the metabolic uh, products of all this pathway? One of them is angiotensin 3, where a single amino acid has been removed from the N-terminal end of the angiotensin 2. And then the other one, also a seven amino acid peptide, is angiotensin 1 to 7. And this is removal of the C-terminal amino acid. And angiotensin 1 itself also gets metabolized by removal of a single amino acid to angiotensin 1 to 9. And it turns out all of these amino acids, all of these peptides rather, have functions and very similar in structure, but not necessarily similar in function, as we will see on the next slide. So here's our angiotensin 2, and it is ACE2, the enzyme that we're interested in for COVID that converts angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 to 7. And if the normal activity of angiotensin 2 for its blood pressure raising effect is on a receptor known as the AT1 receptor. And this is often called the classical arm. So vasoconstriction, uh, aldosterone release, and it happens to also be pro-inflammatory. But when you convert angiotensin 2 to either angiotensin 3 or angiotensin 1 to 7, we have triggered then a counter-regulatory pathway. So uh, the receptor for ANG1 to 7 is called a mass receptor, and it has blood pressure lowering effects that actually oppose the effects of angiotensin 2. And then the AT2 receptor is the primary receptor for angiotensin 3, and it also is protective. So what we have now is an example of homeostasis in the body where you've got this balance between the two different uh, peptides, angiotensin 2 raising blood pressure, angiotensin 1 to 7 decreasing blood pressure, with ACE being the enzyme for angiotensin 2 production and ACE2 being the enzyme for angiotensin 1 to 7 production. So now what's going to happen when the system is taken out of balance? Uh, we know that SARS-CoV-2 uh, is going to bind to ACE2 receptors, and we can also see a change when using some of the antihypertensive drugs that act on the, the pathway. So this, is, uh, this figure sort of summarizes all that we've talked about so far. You can see the peptides and the receptors here. And we have ACE2 producing angiotensin 1 to 7, and it also produces angiotensin 1 to 9, which has the same counter regulatory effects as 1 to 7 and angiotensin 3. And then we also have drugs that are commonly used for treating high blood pressure, hypertension. We have ACE inhibitors, sometimes simply called ACEs. And then we have angiotensin 1 receptor blockers, commonly called ARBs. So I give the students this figure, and the question I ask them 
is predict what happens to ACE2 concentrations in a person who is taking an angiotensin receptor blocker, an ARB, or an ACE inhibitor, and explain. Well, my students sometimes have trouble uh, doing multiple steps uh, of a thought process. So when they get stuck on this, which they often do, I break it down. So the first question would be, what effect do ACE inhibitors have on the concentration of angiotensin 1? Well, if you're blocking the conversion of 1 to 2 using an ACE inhibitor, then angiotensin 1 concentrations are going to go up. And similarly, what effect would ARBs have on the concentration of angiotensin 2? Same thing, block action at the receptor, and you're going to predict an increase in the angiotensin II levels. So it turns out if those concentrations of substrate are simply going up, with a fixed amount of enzyme, you're going to see an increased uh, rate of reaction. But when you have chronic elevation of substrate, which is what you would have when you're giving someone drugs that chronically block these pathways, very often the cell is going to induce synthesis of more enzyme. So the prediction is going to be that cells are going to upregulate their ACE2 expression in response to the increased substrate caused by giving these antihypertensive drugs. Now, if we take that and we go to the next question, if that's true and we've got increased ACE2 expression, What's going to happen to the SARS-CoV-2 entry into cells? Well, you'd assume that if ACE2 is the receptor, it's going to make it a lot easier for cells to take up virus. And so what we've done now through this series of predictions is we've generated a testable hypothesis. The question then becomes, are people who take ACE inhibitors or ARBs more likely to develop COVID-19 or to have more severe disease? Let's look at the evidence. So it turns out about a year ago, there was an article in The Lancet that came out that was predicting based on the physiology we've just talked about, that people who were being treated for hypertension with ACE inhibitors and ARBs would have an increased risk of severe COVID-19 because they would have a higher viral load. And this created great consternation. Patients were calling their doctors and saying, should I stop taking my drugs? Doctors didn't know what to answer because there really wasn't, it was an unknown at that time. So a lot of studies started uh, being done, observational studies looking at uh, the incidence of COVID-19 and people on different drugs and not on different drugs. And by last summer, the studies were suggesting that the drugs were not harmful. And fortunately, there has been uh, a series of articles in a journal called Annals of Internal Medicine. And they have, throughout the pandemic, been doing a series of what they call update alerts. They had one on chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. They had a series. They have another one on masking that I've used with my students. And they also have been following the uh, evidence for ACEs and ARBs and the development of COVID-19. And what they would do is periodically have some of their experts review all of the reviews and then do an analysis of the reviews and any studies that have come out. So the update that just came out last month in February uh, looked at reviews and studies through November of 2020. And their conclusion was that ACE inhibitors and ARBs do not increase the risk of COVID-19 and also are not associated with more severe disease. So here's a case where you can have the students make predictions and then you can show them what's happened. So obviously this is more complex than simply the upregulation of ACE2. So now that the students have a good sense of how the uh, coronavirus gets into the cells, the next question I pose to them is how can we use what we know about SARS-CoV-2 to either 
slow down or prevent infection or slow the development of COVID-19. And so we go back to this same figure that you've seen before. And I ask the students to think of all the ways you could prevent SARS-CoV-2 from infecting and reproducing in host cells. Go step by step and describe how your intervention would act to disrupt the process. So some of the answers that I would expect from them, one would be do something to keep the virus from binding to ACE2. And I think we now know that antibodies are going to be the answer, whether they're endogenous produced by the body's own immune cells, or they are monoclonal antibodies produced as drugs, or even as we've seen the transfusion of plasma from people who've had the disease and have antibodies present. I would also expect the students to possibly say, well, let's just block the binding site on ACE2. And the question that come, I would give back to them is, why might not, that not be as good an idea as blocking the virus? And the answer is, if you block all the ACE2 binding sites, what are you disrupting in terms of the normal physiology? The next step that I might expect would be to prevent endocytosis, because if the virus cannot get into the cell, then it can't infect it. And it turns out there's a very interesting study that was in a preprint server and it just came out in the uh, peer reviewed form. And there is a group that is using something called a lipopeptide fusion inhibitor that blocks fusion between the viral capsule and the host cell membrane. And if you don't get that fusion, you can't let the RNA loose into the host cell. And this was a series uh, done with ferrets and it's a fairly simple experimental design if you want to show it to your students. And uh, the ferrets were given a nasal spray and then simply put in cages with infected ferrets. And the ferrets using the nasal spray with the fusion inhibitor did not develop COVID. So this may be something that we see as a preventative coming down the road. I also give the students this figure which is a sort of a generic figure showing different ways that viruses get into and out of cells. And so now let's think about what we might do. It's in the cell. How could we possibly prevent it from reproducing? And so this is, turns out to be where most of the antiviral drugs are working. And as I said, I don't teach immunology or virology. So I sort of uh, go generally over this part, but basically anything you can do to interfere with transcription and translation is going to help prevent the viral reproduction. So the interferons then that are part of our innate immune system are going to be protein synthesis inhibitors, and then remdesivir, which is our approved antiviral, helps prevent the replication of the RNA. Another way to think about it would be what, what can we do to stimulate the immune cells so that we can promote the immune response. And this is where our vaccines come in, that by getting our immune system geared up, we then have the ability to, uh, to slow down at least, if not totally prevent the reproduction of the virus. So we've looked at the process of infection, and we've looked at some ways to think about that. So next, let's turn to the pathophysiology of COVID-19. And it turns out, um, this is a, a nice figure that's freely available. And so the question, I would show this to my students, and I'd say, uh, where do you think, predict where you might see uh, infection with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 having an effect in a case of COVID-19. And looking at all the tissues where you find ACE2 receptors, there are a lot of different places, but notice how many there are in the heart, which is we know is one of the, the pathological uh, problems that occurs in the disease. But if you ask them what it's, which of these will be the most susceptible, then you have to think back to your three stages of the immune response, with the first stage being a barrier function. And so the vulnerable spots are the 
airways, and we know that this virus is known to be a respiratory virus, but also the gut, because these are the two interfaces with the external environment that do not have the heavy barrier function of the skin and uh, integument. There are barriers, but they tend to be chemical and uh, the mucus that will help trap the viral particles. So just as a quick summary, COVID-19 has been described as an atypical pneumonia because the virus gets into the respiratory system it gets into the respiratory epithelial cells using ACE2 as the receptor. And then between the infection itself with the virus taking over the normal cell mechanisms, as well as the potentially the immune response destroying the epithelial cells, you end up with death of the epithelial cells and, an, and a viral pneumonia. This is a picture from that uh, same function article that uh, you've seen two other images from. And this is showing the airways and the histology of the airways in the normal physiology. So the defense for the airways, because they are faced with both keeping pathogens out but exchanging gases, um, starts in the upper airways with the mucociliary escalator where you have mucus being produced and the ciliated epithelial cells then beating it upward to into the, the oropharynx where it can either be coughed out or swallowed. And so you see the three levels there all the way down to the level of the bronchioles. Then in a non-diseased person in the level of the alveoli, you have a minimal fluid layer there just enough to help dissolve the gases because you've got a balance between filtration out of the capillary and across the type 1 alveolar cells balanced by fluid reabsorption through the type 2 alveolar cells. In COVID, what we see is that the mucociliary escalator gets disrupted because the ciliated epithelial cells have ACE2 receptors and they're invaded and damaged, as well as the goblet cells that can no longer produce mucus. This means now then that the viral particles are getting lower and lower in farther and farther into the, into the respiratory tract. And down at the level of the alveoli, you get impaired fluid clearance because it turns out the type 2 alveolar cells also have ACE2 receptors and they then become targets for the virus and their function gets disrupted. The result then is a pulmonary edema and the accumulation of fluid within the alveoli is going to lead to hypoxia. So this is, um, this is about where I leave it with my students. But um, there are a number of areas to, that we can explore in terms of pathophysiology, um, depending upon your comfort. What I would say is uh, go cautiously with the pathophysiology because there's a lot that we don't understand yet. I mean, we can describe it, but we don't understand the mechanisms. And, and physiology is all about mechanisms. So one of them that's very interesting, and I'll say some more words on the next slide, is the one that's been called in the press happy hypoxia, which is more correctly called silent hypoxemia. And this occurs when people show up in the ER with uh, arterial oxygen uh, saturations of uh, PO2s of less than 40 millimeters of mercury, which uh, then can lead to uh, various various uh, problems, but these people don't realize that they're hypoxic and they're breathing normally, they're not complaining of dyspnea, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, I mentioned the role of the epithelial sodium channel in pulmonary edema, and that's what you saw on the previous slide, and uh, that article is in your resource list that's posted. 
One of the interesting things is the GI systems because symptoms because the virus can invade the enterocytes of the intestine. And this is actually a picture uh, from Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And the green dots there are showing you COVID uh, coronavirus particles in the enterocytes. And this is three months after the infection. And so the, the Hughes article is about the fact that it's probably their presence is probably helping keep antibody levels higher and more sustained than they might be if they than if the viral infection was completely cleared. Uh, another area that uh, you could explore would be the hypercoagulability, which is uh, indicated by these microclots that have been uh, described in various organs. And if you already teach immune system, uh, you can talk about the cytokine storm and bradykinin and the potential roles for, for those chemicals. Um, I don't teach that, so I generally tend to avoid it. Myocarditis, we said, has been one of the uh, pathologies that's been well described and the role of ACE2 was in the myocardium is probably one of the reasons that the heart becomes a target. And then you've got the neurological symptoms, the loss of taste and smell that has uh, been described as being characteristic as a first sign. And age differences infection. Why is it the children don't get infected? And the elderly are much more susceptible. So these are some of the possible areas if you were interested in exploring. Um, I picked silent hypoxemia because it's a, a good example of uncertainty in science. There's the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine that is uh, uh, physicians that are taking care of people in the ICU. And back in August, they had a very nice article about hypoxemia, silent hypoxemia, and it goes into some of the physiological mechanisms that they felt could explain why these patients were not complaining of dyspnea and exhibiting elevated uh, ventilation. And uh, if you want to teach this, I highly recommend it. And again, it's listed in the resources. Then in December, there was a letter to the editor that came out that actually disagreed with the first article and said, no, that's not it at all. This is really uh, an issue of hypocapnia and a, a left to right uh, pulmonary shunt, or sorry, right to left uh, pulmonary, uh, intrapulmonary shunt from uh, underventilated alveoli. And um, so, that came out and then in reply to that the original uh, authors came back and rebutted that so i think it's important for our students to see that even even the scientists can't agree on what's going on with the pathophysiology and this is one of the reasons that i would sort of caution about the teaching too much of the pathophysiology um, depending upon your students there are some other fun things that you can do with them um, having them critique the evidence for masking. And as I said, the, uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine has some links to great articles where they can look at the science. You might pick one of these and have them to critique the study design and the conclusions and maybe even propose how they might do the science differently. Um, picking a social media post, for instance, there was a social media post that said, oh, the vaccines are causing an increase in Bell's palsy. Um, and so is that is that true? Is that accurate? And then having students create educational material for their peers or their families to explain why you can't get COVID from a vaccine. So there are a lot of areas that you can explore with your students for this, this type of thing. But as we conclude, I'd like to say, I think the, the beauty of teaching COVID in the physiology class is that we have a chance to get our students to appreciate that science is not a series of facts. And so, there's a lot we don't know, and they need to understand that we don't have the answers to everything. 
and that even the experts don't agree. So that scientific knowledge is based on models. And as the evidence changes, the models change as well. I think our students have a tendency to want us to tell them the facts. Just tell me these facts so I can learn them and get on to the next thing in my life. And they have to learn to be flexible in their knowledge bank and also to tolerate ambiguity. The, the fact that we can't tell them the fact because nobody knows what the truth is. And that there may be three or four different truths depending upon who's looking at the, the information. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back to Sarah for an audience poll, and then I think we will uh, finish up with questions. Thank you so much for your attention today. Thanks so much for that, Dee. Uh, it was a really great presentation and really kind of drives home the point of, you know, we don't really know what's going on, but it's great to teach about it, and it's great for the students to experience what it's like to watch science evolve, which is really cool. Um, so before we get on to the q and A, I I did want to run one more quick audience poll. Um, so please participate in this poll. We really appreciate your response. Um, so are you currently a HAPS member, yes or no? Um, and while you guys are answering that, I would love to read a couple comments that have come in that are really positive um, about your presentation, Dee. Um, so Gregory has said, thank you very much for your presentation and time. Um, Scott has said, thank you. Wendy earlier said um, that she loves AD Instruments and she loves HAPS and she's really happy um, that we're doing all of these presentations. So it's a really um, a great platform for everyone. Um, all right, so it looks like most people have answered that poll question. And we have a ton of questions coming in, which is really awesome. Um, Dee, I'm gonna bring you back on. Are you with us? I'm here, yep. Great. Okay, um, so let's get started with our first question here. Um, so this question is, why are young children less susceptible to COVID-19? Well, this is another one of, we don't know. I've seen three different theories floated. One has to do with their immune systems, which I'm not sure is the right answer. There is some evidence showing that they do not have as many ACE2 receptors on the surface of their cells. But the one that I found most interesting is that the uh, SARS-CoV-2 is primarily an upper respiratory infection. And a lot of it is uh, go from exposure to the nasal cavity and the sinuses. And it turns out that children don't really have fully a fully developed sinus system until they're about 12 years old. And so it could simply be that they uh, don't have the surface area to be invaded and therefore that is making them less susceptible. Okay, I mean, that does make a lot of sense. Uh, we're getting a ton of questions flooding in, so bear with me while I pick the next one. Um, Okay, so this question is, uh, what is causing the loss of taste and smell in COVID-19? Um, the issue of taste, I think no one has, has quite figured out, um, and it could simply be related to the, the loss of smell. Um, there was some question about whether it was actually affecting the olfactory neurons, but it turns out the olfactory neurons don't have ACE2 receptors. What does have significant number of ACE2 receptors are the sustentacular support cells in the olfactory epithelium. And the maintenance of the neurons requires functioning uh, support cells. And so when the support cells go down, the neuron function goes down and they, the neurons actually lose their cilia. Um, and in, in most cases, it, it will uh, resolve after the infection. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Great. Um, okay, so the next question here is from Anne. Anne has asked, what happens to the 442 other amino acids of angiotensinogen? Good question. I have no idea. I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen that discussed. <laughs> okay, great. Sorry about that, Anne. 
um, but might be something worth looking into. Uh, the next question here is, um, do you spread this topic over a couple weeks or and do you incorporate it into various organ systems when you teach it? I, um, I have been doing it sort of piecemeal where we do a little bit up front. As I said, I introduce because we don't do immunology. I introduce the virus and a little bit about the different types of immune cells at the beginning. Um, and then I generally pop it into whatever the system is. But uh, as you can tell, particularly the respiratory system. Right. That makes sense. Um, okay, the next question here is from Scott. Um, he's asked, well, it's kind of a long question, so I'll read it out. Uh, when the mRNA vaccine is given and taken up by muscle cells, the muscle cell supposedly puts the spike protein that was made on its membrane attached to MHC1 molecules. This activates cytotoxic T cells. Do these cytotoxic T cells attack the muscle cell that had the MHC1 molecule? Um, good question. I don't know. I'm wondering, you know, thinking it through, given that one of the side effects is muscle aches and such. So it's possible. I would think that it was possible. Um, I thought that the, yes, it is activating the cytotoxic, but I thought the main function was to try and get the, the B cells up and turning out antibody. So good question. As I said, I don't teach immunology and I'm, it's not my field. I don't know the answer. Okay. Um, we have another question here. Uh, in which scenario um, do you use the SARS-CoV-2 material? So is it like a seminar on pathophysiology? Um, do you integrate it with other physiology symptoms or in little bits and pieces into your physiology classes? I do it in bits and pieces. Um, as, I, as I said at the beginning, I have those icons that I use. And then um, as we come up uh, upon something that's relevant, I will uh, pop it into the, the normal physiology. We also are fortunate to have discussion or tutorial sessions, one hour discussions and tutorials. So we're able to um, give students uh, some work on group assignments in there, for instance, the one about masking and having them look at the uh, some of the papers, the observational papers on the efficacy of masking and critique them. And uh, so we can do it both in the big lecture class as well as in these one hour tutorials. Great. Okay, so before we move on to more questions, because we do still have a couple minutes left, I did want to catch people before they head out. Um, on the slide that's visible on your screen, there is a button that says Series Info. If you missed any of the other presentations in this four-part series, or you're looking to register for the next presentation by John Waters, please click that button and it'll take you to a landing page where you can sign up for those um, presentations that you missed. Um, and we do have time for a couple more questions, if that's okay with you, Dee. So I'll move on to the next one. Um, so this question is, is there evidence that introducing COVID-related material makes students more motivated to approach studying physiology in the integrated manner that you've described? I don't know of any evidence. I mean, it's completely anecdotal, but I know my students seem to be more interested in learning the basics because then it helps them understand what's going on in the world around them. But I don't know of anybody that's uh, actually done a formal study of this. Right. I mean, that that does make sense. Um, getting them excited about a topic that's relevant to them would probably interest them more. Um, before we move on to our final question, I did want to bring everyone's attention to the survey, which I'm going to have wiggle on your screen there. Please take a couple minutes and fill that out. We'd love to hear from you about um, your experience today and then also some upcoming um, webinar topics and a few questions um, there for you to fill out. So please take some time and fill that out. We really appreciate it. And our last question here is um, what eye cells or tissue 
um, has ACE2 receptors? Uh, good question. Is there some simple way for me to go back uh, in the slides to look at yep. that? Uh, what slide, slide would thing? you like? Yeah, I don't know. That's why I'm trying to go back. It's the one with the pictures. Uh, this one? That's it. There we go. Yep. And so what does it say? Pigmented epithelial cells, which are epithelial cells, rod and cone photoreceptors, and the Mueller glial cells. So that's where you find it. I have I don't remember hearing anything about uh, complications related to the eyes. So okay. somebody else may know that, but I, I don't remember that being a, a primary problem. I think the the vasculature and the heart are the the main complications that have been cropping up that people are interested in. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, um, thank you so much again, Dee, for your fantastic presentation. I did want to bring everyone's attention to the series info one more time, as well as the survey. Uh, so we'd love to hear from you. Um, and also, thank you for being here today. We love having a live audience, and we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Um, and lastly, if you're curious about the upcoming events, um, the last one is by John Waters, and it's about integrating the anatomy and physiology um, and human biology all together and talking about all the species in the world and how they relate. So it's a very fantastic presentation. Um, we're getting really excited for it. That one's on April 15th at the same time today. So that's a Thursday. Um, so please join us for that. And if you do uh, miss it, that's okay. A recording will be available. And in closing, thanks for taking part in this webinar. You'll receive an email later today or early tomorrow um, giving you access to resources like the recording and the slides. And any questions that you have for D that didn't get answered today will be answered in a Q&A report that we will be sending out in the next couple of weeks. Um, so D will type up some answers for you to the questions we didn't get to live. Um, so if you do have any other questions for Dee, please send them in now using the Ask a Question panel, and uh, we will make sure to pass them along to her. Um, so again, in closing, thank you for being here today, and we hope that you have a lovely rest of your day.